you all the speakers today. We are wrapping up with our uh, closing day one keynote presentation. Very important session on institutional investment opportunities, bridging the funding gap in the area of the vanishing middle market. And we're really excited to have uh, this lineup on this session. This, this session is comprised of um, panel presentations, and then there'll be some time for, for questions and, and answers at the end. We're gonna start with Brian Korn, who's an attorney at Pepper Hamilton, and then we'll go from Brian to Aaron Kellner, who's taking Ryan Feet's uh, place from the seed investment, and then we'll wrap with um, Anthony Zioli, who joined us earlier today. Thank you again, and we'll start with Brian. So I'm just going to talk very briefly, and uh, some of this we've gone over, and I'll, I'll gloss over that. But I think the real issue here and the real topic of our panel is uh, we have crowdfunding, we have Reg A, we have private placements, and by the way, we also have the public markets and the IPO market. Uh, how do we see it all working together? What are your options? If you're a company that's looking to go out, um, what does this really leave you with in terms of a corporate finance dashboard going forward, and uh, do we see as IPOs become more selective and the market becomes uh, a little more selective, although the GoPro deal is, is now a uh, in that trend, um, do we see that companies that would consider an IPO uh, are going to look at crowdfunding, are they going to look at Reg A, are they going to stick with venture money, are they going to stick with bridge money? Uh, those are all unanswered questions, but, but the right questions I think to ask. Um, I have a couple of slides which I'll go through. Uh, so the Jobs Act, uh, as, as people mentioned, what I think was a real game changer. I think that uh, you had uh, three main proponents of the Jobs Act. Uh, number one, the crowdfunding initiative, so the ability to raise money from uh, the general public without registering with the SEC is a major sea change in, in finance. Uh, generally, transactions are either registered or private placements. Uh, the ability to do a private placement to the general public uh, through what we call title through accredited investor financing uh, is another major development. And then finally, for IPOs themselves, uh, you had something called the IPO on-ramp Title I, uh, the ability to raise money through an IPO uh, and go through a, a slightly less costly process. Uh, there are also a couple of other initiatives in the Jobs Act that a lot of people don't talk about, decimalization, uh, the ability in the SEC to study and, and consider raising the tick size increments up to nine cents a share. Uh, they've done a study on that. I believe the conclusion was that they're not going to do that. Um, and uh, you also have the go public thresholds. Uh, companies uh, in the old days, if they had 10 million of assets, had to file and go public whether they wanted to or not if they had 500 shareholders under the Jobs Act. Uh, that number was increased to 2,000 with a maximum of 500 non-accredited investors. You also don't have to count employees who receive shares as part of the employee compensation plan, and you also don't have to count Title III crowdfunded shares. So that was all uh, in response to companies, uh, most notably te uh, Facebook, that were complaining that the system required them to go public even if they didn't want to because of the shareholder count number. So the IPO on ramp Title I, really uh, was born of a couple of things. One is the perception that IPOs are expensive, uh, compliance with Sarbanes-Oxley is costly, and it's keeping people on the sidelines uh, from doing initial public offerings. Uh, IPOs are generally good for the economy, they're good for lawyers and bankers and business people and accountants, uh, but they're also good because they raise capital for companies, uh, you allow trading in a transparent marketplace, and you also have um, the ability to enhance and reward employees uh, in, in, a, in a slightly more democratic way than you have in a private company. Um, just a reminder, the typical IPO timeline, uh, you're still looking at uh, three to six months to get it done. Uh, you have your SEC filing of the registration statement, which is a very long document. Uh, it has a business section, a management discussion, analysis of results of operation, risk factors, uh, all sorts of other disclosure about shareholders, uh, a summary section, your audited financials, uh, and, uh, and uh, material agreements, related party transactions, uh, kind of a soup to nuts overview of the whole company. Uh, and that takes time to write, it takes time to file, 
Uh, the SEC then has a review process where they respond within 30 days with your first set of comments. Uh, you will generally file the response to those comments within two weeks, and there's a back and forth until you're finally ready to have your comments uh, completed, and then you're declared effective by the SEC. Uh, during this process, investment bankers take the company on the road. There is a marketing process that happens. Um, it's all very costly. And what's interesting also about IPOs is that uh, you generally don't sign engagement letters, unlike private placements and pipe transactions. Uh, both the bankers and the company are at risk for their own expenses until the deal actually prices and an underwriting agreement is signed. Uh, and so it's a, a little bit of a delicate dance in terms of uh, getting the company and the bankers and the accountants and the lawyers to work together in the process and move the process forward. Uh, the Jobs Act created something called the Emerging Growth Company, which is a new type of company that has a billion dollars or less in revenues, uh, or less than a billion dollars in revenues in the last audited fiscal year. Uh, emerging growth companies uh, also uh, have not issued more than $1 billion of debt in the last three years. And, and generally, uh, an emerging growth company is able to take care, uh, advantage of several uh, shortcuts in the IPO process that other companies did not. Uh, emerging growth company has a five-year maximum, so once you're public, you can stay an emerging growth company uh, until you reach a billion dollars in revenue, uh, or five years, whichever comes first. And uh, electing emerging growth company status is optional. Uh, a company does not need to be new or a startup. It does not need to be emerging. It does not need to have growth. Uh, you have uh, uh, Manchester United, the uh, English soccer team, uh, went public last year. They have their roots in the 1800s. Uh, they were an emerging growth company on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, Facebook, for example, was not an emerging growth company because their billions are north. Of, their revenue is north of a billion dollars. Alibaba is not an emerging growth company. Uh, Twitter did qualify. Uh, what do you get to do as an EGC? So first thing is uh, you can file your registration statement confidentially with the SEC as long as it's filed at least 21 days prior to the commencement of your roadshow. Um, you can test the waters. You can have meetings with investors to decide if the deal is going to be successful. Uh, when I worked for a bank, we called this pre-market, the ability to go out to investors, test the transaction, see if it's actually going to work. Are there tweaks to the structure of the capital structure? Are there tweaks to the business, the material agreements that we should be making to make the deal more appetizing to investors? Uh, that is a tool that is not available to non-emerging growth companies uh, because of the quiet periods uh, that go along with uh, making oral offers to investors before a registration statement is on file. Um, and is something that, uh, although slow in the take up, we've seen emerging growth companies definitely take advantage of. Uh, reduced disclosure. Uh, another big issue, financial statements. Uh, two years of audited financial statements uh, instead of three. Uh, you do not need a compensation disclosure and analysis. Uh, you do not need uh, a say on pay vote once you go public. Uh, you do not need the CEO to medium employee uh, disclosure, which is always very popular for, uh, for a lot of companies where they disclose that the CEO makes uh, 200,000 times more than the median employee. Um, and uh, you also do not need to comply with new financial accounting standards if you elect uh, to do so. Uh, also, changes in the, in the process, underwriting agreements uh, uh, and disclosure have been changed. So the emerging growth company has created a structure where we no longer have visibility over the IPO pipeline until companies are at least 21 days out from starting their roadshow. Um, on the other hand, what you also have is companies that are more likely to test the waters because they're not taking the reputational risk of trying to do an IPO and failing. And that was something that was perceived to hold the market back slightly. Um, the other big issue with emerging growth companies, you do not have to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley 404B, which is the auditor attestation test, um, and also a subject of a lot of expense, and it, virtually every emerging growth company is taking advantage of that. Um, as I mentioned before, the other issues on the Jobs Act, the advertised private placement rules. So now you have a choice. Private placements under the old rules, up to 35 non-accredited investors with disclosure, or uh, unlimited accredited investors, an unlimited amount can be raised. New rule, 506C, you can advertise, um, but if you advertise, you can only sell to accreds, and you have to verify that the accreds are, uh, in fact, accredited. Um, What's happening in the crowdfunding world is most of the crowdfunding sites are using a Title II mechanic, and they're going through either a 506B or C. 
Now, some people, including a lot of people at the SEC, thought, well, anything that's online is advertising, so how can you possibly have a 506 be uh, unadvertised online uh, transaction? Um, what a lot of folks have gotten comfortable with and what the staff has generally concurred with in recent cd and is that if you are uh, in that world where your splash page does not have live deals and you don't have an investable transaction or something somebody can click on as soon as they go to your page and, and you have to go through a password wall where somebody self-certifies that they're credited, uh, then, the, I, then you are still not soliciting, similar to other transactions uh, pre-Jobs Act, uh, where people had to log in to a, to a login page to get a password. Um, and, and that's generally seen as a non-solicited. So a lot of websites are choosing do I want to have all my deals behind a password and not verify credit investor status? Or do I want to have a lot of deals up front? I want to show people um, you know, all, all sorts of transactions. You see that on real estate sites. I want to see a green progress line going across the page that says I only need to raise another $50,000. If I want to show that, then you have to verify. Um, verification can be self-verification, or you can hire an expert to do it for you. Uh, the, SEC has proposed uh, comments on whether they should change the accredited investor test. Uh, my prediction is that you won't see that happening. I think people have gotten very comfortable with the $200,000, $300,000 mechanic and the $1 million net worth test. Um, if you changed it and you indexed it to some rate, then you'd have some odd numbers coming out once it got adjusted. I don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, there are amendments proposed, which we don't know if they're going to pass, where you'd have to file a Form D uh, at least uh, 15 days in advance of your Reg D offering and at least 30 days post-closing. Uh, if you fail to file that, then you actually are suspended from private placements for a year. Uh, that's gotten a lot of controversy. A lot of people have commented, this is too tough, too harsh. I think that the one-year penalty is not going to survive, but I think that you're still going to have to do something, and that's going to be a big change for this world where Reg D filings of Form Ds have been more or less voluntary or at least lax. Um, and, and actually having to go through the process of filing the form and the delaying effect of the 15 days is going to be interesting. So crowdfunding, um, we currently have five varieties of crowdfunding and, and a lot of this is in Mark's uh, memo. Uh, the rewards donation world is interesting. We're seeing a lot of reward sites that are pivoting towards a Title III mechanic and possibly a Title II. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that um, if, if, if that's going to work. I mean, they certainly have a lot of eyeballs, so you know, I think it's a great uh, play to take advantage and move beyond the rewards field. Um, I always tell people in the rewards field that they're kind of lucky because they're sidestepping a lot of the regulations on the investment advisor, on the broker-dealer issues, on the lending issues that you have on the other sites, and um, they should just take their 10% and be happy. Uh, there is a question as to whether rewards will really survive once the novelty wears off of having a Kickstarter campaign, um, and maybe we can talk about that in a little bit. I've seen uh, statistics that, uh, uh, especially on some sites, you'll have, um, I think, uh, well, AngelList, uh, only about 5% of deals on AngelList actually get funded. Um, and so the selectivity and having a site that deals don't get lost, things are findable. If you're interested in something, you can go find it. Um, I think that's gonna be in a premium. Um, the Title II world is where we're seeing most of the transactions these days, either in the startup space or in the real estate space. Uh, Title III TBD, uh, as we mentioned before, I think the restrictions are extremely harsh. Uh, when the bill came out of the House, uh, the cap on uh, the amount you could raise was $10 million, and the Senate dropped it down to $1 million, and they also dropped down the investor caps. And there are some people that think that was a a, uh, done by design so that Title III essentially couldn't be workable because if you think about Title III, uh, you have all these other sites, you have Title II crowdfunding, you have mainstream venture investing, you have friends and family rounds, you have uh, the, the rest of the investment world. Uh, there's a fear out there that uh, Title III will become the funding of last resort. And it's also open to the widest group of people. And so when you take deals in startup worlds, which are already extremely risky asset class, and you turn them in uh, and, and you winnow them down to the folks that can't get funding any other way than to file an SEC registration uh, disclosure doc, take prospective style liability, uh, go through the process of hiring a funding portal, very expensive cost of capital uh, for the amounts you can actually raise, 
Um, and then you're sending, selling that to the mom and pop investors. So I think that there is a disconnect there and I think you're seeing a lot of foot dragging uh, by design by Washington because uh, not every deal is going to work out. There will be a train wreck. I think in the last panel someone said failure doesn't always mean fraud. I think there will be fraud. I think there will be a lot of failure. Um, and uh, even in the adventure world, failure is very commonplace. And uh, I think that there's a fear that this will uh, impact a lot of people and hurt them. Can I ask uh, a question? Sure. Okay, maybe it's in the next slide. But can you go back to that slide? So I'm, maybe I'm, just asking, I'm still somewhat confused as to the difference between peer to peer lending and, and companies that are operating in the Title II, you know, 506C. Because I think there's companies under Title II that are focusing on the lending business. Right. So, so I don't understand, like, what's the differentiation? Okay, so so peer to peer lending is essentially debt crowdfunding. It is borrowing money. A borrower goes on a site, uh, applies to borrow money. Uh, the crowd funds the loan, uh, and that person actually has their loan funded. They they could have a five thousand up to thirty five thousand dollar loan. Uh, if you go on Lending Club or Prosper, uh, those loans are either sold in the whole loan market to institutions, or they're sold in the partial loan market to individuals, and um, they don't know who the borrower is. Uh, it, it's kind of comical because it, somebody told me that they asked their friends and family for money uh, and they said no, but they went on Prosper and their loan was funded in five days and some of it was probably by some of the people who told them no if they knew who they were. So you know the, the anonymity we have in the US and, and, and the, the culture of, of, of the online world and. Yeah, I'd rather not know who this person is. I'd rather just you know, lend to them based on their stats. Um, really works in this case. Now, Lending Club and Prosper are not Title II platforms. Uh, they are actually registered S1 companies. So uh, they have two or three products. The first product is they sell whole loans by the, by the dozen to institutional investors. About 80% of their market right now is selling whole loans to institutions. About 20% is the fractional marketplace. And the fractional loans are actually borrower payment dependent notes, which are issued by an affiliate